I was preaching a revival meeting shortly before I preached the meeting here, I think in November, and I was preaching a revival meeting this fall in a church. And it was a church where I had preached seven revivals, seven falls in a row. And the pastor said, Brother Miller, I don't know if I'm going to have you back for a revival meeting again or not. And I thought, oh, what did I do? And uh, before I could say, oh, what did I do? He said, I don't even know if I'm going to have revival meetings anymore or not. And uh, now I was able to say what I was thinking. Why? He said, because every time we're getting ready for a revival, the devil sees what we're doing. And he said, it costs us. He said, I remember one year we were going to have a revival meeting. We're having prayer meetings for four months leading up to it. And the third week, somebody stood up and said, this is ridiculous, praying at 5.30 in the morning over at the church for four months. We're not going to do that anymore. And a bunch of people said, yeah, we're not going to do that anymore. And he said, call off this revival meeting. Most of the church wants to call off the revival meeting. The pastor said, well, if only my wife and I want to have the revival meeting, we're going to have the meeting and ask God to send a revival. And if she doesn't want to do it, I'm going to do it. Just don't come if you don't want to come. Well, a fourth of his church left because they didn't want to have a revival meeting. <laughs> they just wanted to have church on Sunday. And uh, he said, do you remember that? I said, I remember that. And I said, but I also remember, Pastor, that that week uh, following, 22 people got saved. He said, I know, but it cost me a fourth of my church. And he said, then, uh, do you remember that year when we were getting ready to have revival? And the head over one of my ministries, a deacon, uh, sent me a letter and had it sitting, uh, uh, brought a letter into the church and had it sitting on the platform and I get up and look at it before Sunday school and he said, I resign. I resign all my positions. My wife resigns all her positions. We're not going to come here anymore. You're not scriptural. And he didn't tell me who I wasn't scriptural. I said, I remember that. And he said, he, he assured me he wouldn't try to get anybody else to leave but he got four families to leave in the next two months. Do you remember that? I said, I remember that. But I also remember that 32 people got saved in the two-week revival that followed. He said, yeah, but that cost me some more of my church. And he said, it cost too much this year. And I said, what's going on? He said, just a couple weeks ago, two weeks ago, my daughter-in-law calls me and says that her husband, my son, who was on a church staff, left her. He said, now I raised two boys. One of them's a pastor, the other was on church staff. <clears throat> and he left his wife. And he left, I forget, two or three children. And uh, she was going to have to move back uh, to someplace down south, move in with her uh, dad and her mom until she could get a job and support herself and and said, uh, I can't get a hold of him. He won't talk to me. He won't talk to anybody else. <clears throat> he just left her. And he said it was his fault, but he was raised in a Christian home. And he never experienced everything there was out there to experience, and he just thought he wanted to experience it for a while. And this preacher was heartbroken. He said the devil couldn't stop us from having these revivals and these great number of people saved by attacking my membership. So he reached into my home and attacked my home. He said, my wife is heartbroken. He said, I'm heartbroken. He said, my daughter-in-law's heartbroken. My grandkids are heartbroken. His brother and sister are heartbroken. He said, I just don't know if I'm going to have revival anymore because the devil fights us too much. Well, you say, Brother Miller, that's, that's sort of an egocentric thought. The devil fights us. No, folks, the devil does fight. The Bible says he walks about as a roaring lion seeking to devour whom he may. And Jesus said that we shouldn't marvel. We shouldn't be surprised. Jesus said that uh, in this world ye shall have what? Tribulation. Tribulation. But he said, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So we're going to have tribulation. And we see in the Bible, we see in the book of Acts that when the church at Jerusalem in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 6, was doing such a great job reaching out and reaching souls that the devil attacked in a number of ways. When that didn't work, he scattered the church. And everybody had to run for their lives out of Jerusalem who were Christians. And folks, uh, we also see, though, that as he attacked the church, the Christians just kept on trusting God and obeying God and going on. 
and souls kept getting saved, and the church got started in Antioch, and the church got started in Lystra, and the church got started in Derby, and the church got started in Philippi, and the church got started in Colossae, and many churches got started in the regions of Galatia, and many churches got started in the regions of Macedonia. Because as the devil attacked, the Bible says, they went everywhere preaching the word. They were fleeing for their lives. But they went everywhere preaching the word, proclaiming the word. I don't want to discourage you, I want to encourage you, but expect the devil to try to stop uh, this uh, new emphasis, renewed emphasis on outreach on Saturday mornings. Uh, besides the lethargy and lackadaisicalness of the members, say, I don't care, I'm going to keep doing what I do every Saturday morning, he's going to try to uh, uh, deliver a knockout punch. And I want to tell you, the devil fights dirty. The devil fights dirty. This pastor told me, he said, it's my son. And I said, well, of course, we need to keep praying that he comes to his senses and gets right. And I want to show you how far the devil had tempted this preacher. The preacher said, well, I want him to get right. But I'll tell you this, when he gets ready to get right, I want to let him know how many people he's hurt. Uh-oh. Rather than forgiveness and restoration, anger and revenge was beginning to take part in the life of this pastor against his own son. Yeah, but don't you understand how he feels, Brother Miller? I think I can a little bit. But let's see what God says in our passage. The Bible says, brethren, this is to save people. Are you saved? If a man be overtaken in a fault, you see a Christian who's overtaken in a fault. Some sin overtakes them. It might be an addiction. It might be anger. It might be jealousy. It might be a lack of love for uh, your spouse or your kids. It might be adultery, love for somebody else outside of your marriage. If you see a brother overtaken in a fault, you with your spiritual, point it out and condemn them and punish it. Oh, you say, what version are you reading from, Brother Miller? <laughs> oh, oh, what, what does it say? If you see a brother overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. We're commanded here to restore them. Now, the word restore means to reset the bone to reset the bone. So here's somebody who spiritually has a broken bone. And you know if you have a broken bone, depending on which bone, it incapacitates you to some degree. There's some things that you can't do anymore. I remember when I was coaching basketball, and there was a player who every game he got hurt, so to speak. <laughs> and he liked to pretend like he was hurt. So the fans would feel sorry for him, especially his girlfriend. In one game, he got hurt. He, he uh, turned his ankle and, and sprained his ankle, and he got hurt. And he said, I don't, I don't know if I can play, Brother Miller, and he's sitting there. But the game was really close. And he jumps up and he says, I need to get in the game. I said, okay, get back out there. He's running out there. He is limping around. Uh, but it helped having him on the court. But he, uh, the next time out, he said, I think I need to come out. And I had it. I said, you stay in that game, Dave. You play on that fake injury of yours. <laughs> he played on the fake injury after the game. He went and had it x-rayed, and he had a broken ankle. <laughs> oh, my. And you know what the doctor did? He said, put that ankle up here, son. And he got a sledgehammer out. And he crushed it. One, two, three times. Said, there you go. No, the doctor didn't do that. He reset the bone. He put it in a cast. He said in a couple weeks, if you're careful, you can get a walking cast, but you're not going to play anymore the rest of the season. But the next season he was able to play, and the next season. Why? Because the bone was reset. And the fellow's ankle, therefore the fellow, was rescued. Now that's what God said, Christians and the church and spiritual people are supposed to do. They're not supposed to say, you are in sin. And run around telling everybody and tell them how evil and wicked they are. 
And unfortunately, as this pastor planned on doing, said, yeah, I'm going to forgive you, but first I want you to know how much you hurt people. That isn't what God says spiritual people do here. We're to restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, meaning by God's grace, that could be me. If it was not for his grace, I'm a sinner too. That could be me. It says, lest thou also be tempted. I tell you one thing, I sin, but I'd never do that. I'd never do that. Watch out, God says. Hey, I want, I want to go to a familiar passage. Let's see how Jesus says this is played out. Turn to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. And uh, we are going to look here at the rebellion of the rebellious son, but we're not going to concentrate on that. We're going to concentrate on restoration because that's what God said we're supposed to be doing if we're spiritual. Restoring people, resetting the bone so that the bone is strong and the bone is useful again. And in Luke chapter 15, we have the story of uh, several stories that Jesus told. One was of the lost sheep. And remember what the shepherd did? He left the 99 in the wilderness and he went out and searched for the lost sheep till he found it. And when he found it, uh, he uh, took it to the slaughterhouse and butchered it and had leg of lamb. No. No. He put that sheep on his shoulders and carried it home rejoicing and restored it to the flock. And then the story of the woman, verses 8 to 10, who lost one of her coins. And when she lost one of her 10 pieces of silver, she took a candle, her flashlight, and she was looking under couches and she's sweeping the house and she saw it diligently till she found it. And then she called her neighbors in and said, Rejoice with me, for I found the price which I had lost. Now, folks, that's what God wants to uh, have, that's what heaven and God want to have happen. Because when the shepherd found the sheep and they rejoiced over it, verse 7 says that Jesus said, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. And then in verse 10 he said, likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that is condemned. No. That is ostracized. No. That is shunned like the Amish do as one of their practices, but we do without saying what we're doing. It, You know? Well, just stay away from that guy. Stay away from that woman. No. There's more joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth, the Bible says. And then he tells the story of the lost son. He's had the lost sheep, the lost coin, now the lost son. And uh, he says in verse 11, a certain man had two sons. Now I want you to notice the rebellion of the first son. One of the Ten Commandments is to honor your father and your mother. This fellow did not honor his father and his mother. He wished they were dead. And they didn't die soon enough, so he went and asked for his inheritance, <laughs> which you're not supposed to get till, till uh, uh, the uh, uh, parents die. And the younger son, verse 12, of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. I'm not going to talk to you about being a, uh, a, uh, a parent who should stand up to your children. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, and he took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance in riotous living. And when he had spent all... There arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. He ran out all his money. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed the swine. How much lower can you get when you're a Jew? They were to have nothing to do with pork. And here this rebellious one no longer has the privileges of a Jew. He's a pig feeder. Not only that, look at his wages. The Bible says, verse 16, when he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. Everybody who helped him spend his money, nobody helped him now. And he's eating the husk of the pig food, the corn, probably. The rebellion of the son. We say, Brother Miller, I'm not rebellious like that. The Bible says there's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. That means you're a sinner. That means I'm a sinner. 
The Bible says there's none righteous. No, not one. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all rebelled against God. Well, what's sin? Sin, the Bible says, is the transgression of the law. When God says, thou shalt, and we don't do it, that's a sin. You take every song, I think, this morning, was about reaching the lost, and the scripture verses that Brother Bobby had in between. We are commanded to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. If we don't get involved in this church's soul winning outreach program, we're in sin. For to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Well, I don't know if I can do it Saturday morning. Then tell the preacher when you can do it, and they'll set up a time for you to do it when you can do it. You see. Uh, the Bible says, bring all the tithes and offerings into the storehouse. So we're commanded, but to him that knoweth do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. The Bible says, love your enemies. But we're not, that's not what we're prone to do. We're prone to say, I want to show them that they've hurt me. Sort of like what that preacher said, you know. He went a little further. He called a family meeting after a couple weeks. He said, I don't want anybody contacting your brother. If you contact your brother, he's, he's, Thanksgiving's coming up. He is not welcome in my house or any of your houses. And Christmas is coming up. He is not welcome in my house or any of your houses. We have to show him his great sin and what he's done against us. And I was here preaching the revival a couple weeks later. And the married daughter, who was a brother, a, a, a sister of that brother who had done this, called me on the phone and said, I don't know what to do. Said, I want to reach out to my brother and show him some love and urge him to repent. But dad said that if we do this, we're not welcome in the house either. So I don't know whether to obey Jesus or obey dad. I don't want to dishonor my father. Well, a couple weeks later, he called a church business meeting. And he said, by now you all know what my son did. He said, it's sin, it's wrong. And he said, I don't want any of you getting in touch with him. If you get in touch with him, then it's rebellion against pastoral authority. I'm telling you not to do it. Now that was the attitude of the father. Just think, if this son repents, like we're going to see this fellow in the Bible doing, he doesn't have a home to come home to. He doesn't have a church to come home to till they get their pound of vengeance and flesh out of him. I talked to the father and he said, yeah, I said all that. And I said, are, are you really sure that's the route you want to take? He said, that's, that's what I believe I should do. He needs to know what he did and how wrong it is. I said, well, if he repents, don't you think he's going to know that? Well, we can't let him off easy. I thought, man, when I got saved, God sure let me off easy. I said, I'm sorry, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not guilty. Whew. Oh, you believe in easy believism? It's easy to believe. And Jesus paid it all on the cross. So it's easy to be saved because it was paid in full, you see. Well, I want you to notice this son here in our story that Jesus told. We saw his rebellion. He repented. And the Bible says here in verse 17, when he came to himself, isn't that what we need to pray for people who maybe used to come to this church and they, they drifted away in sin? Oh, they might have said, it's your fault. There's hypocrites at the church. Uh, uh, Pastor Carpenter, he's not perfect. True to all the above. <laughs> There's hypocrites in the church. Pastor Carpenter is not perfect. And in 1 Timothy 3, that's not the qualification of a man who's in the ministry. He must be perfect. Okay? But one day, we need to be praying they come to themselves. They start thinking rightly. I've been out of church for years. That's a sin. I haven't been serving God. That's a sin. I let my kids go to the devil while they were growing up because I was out of church. That's a sin. One day they might come to themselves. And he said, how many, verse 17, hired servants of my father have bread enough to eat and to spare? And I perish with hunger. 
And he comes up with a prayer of repentance. Look at verse 18. I will arise and go to my father, and I'll say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I've sinned against God, and I've sinned against you, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Just let me live out in the bunkhouse. Let me eat servants' rations. Make me as one of thy hired servants. His repentance. And I want you to notice his return. We saw his rebellion. We see his repentance. Notice his return. And he arose, and he came to his father. And when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. And his father had compassion, and his father ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I've sinned against heaven. He started doing this speech he had. And in thy sight I've sinned against you, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. The father said, Stop! Stop! I don't want to hear it. And he says to his servants, Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. When he returned, his father saw him, the Bible says, afar off. You know why? His father was praying for his return. His father was longing for his return. His father was looking for his return. And when it's time to make him know how wrong he was and say, you want to live with the servants? You live with the servants. You're not welcome up at the big house anymore. You're not welcome in the mansion anymore. You'll get the leftovers with the servants. His father didn't say that. His father begins the restoration process. He says, you just stop right now. Bring forth the best robe. That's the father's robe. He's going to give him his robe. Folks, the Bible says that we are naked in our trespasses and sins. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. But when we come to Christ, he puts the robes of righteousness on him, on us. Like Abraham who believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. David believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. The father says, put my robe on him. Get it and put it on him. See the restoration process? Put it on him. And bring a ring. Put a ring on his hand. That, now that ring doesn't just mean he can say, oh boy, that's neat, Dad, thanks. That's a cool ring. This ring was how they signed official documents in the family. That was like giving him the family credit card. That was like giving him power of attorney. He's restored to full sonship. Not servant in the bunkhouse ship. He's restored to full sonship. Well, you know, Brother Miller, Brother so-and-so committed a big sin. We let him know God forgave him, but we're not going to trust him with much from here on out. A couple weeks ago, have you folks ever heard of RU, Reformers Unanimous? Has anybody ever heard of that? Reformers Unanimous is a Christ-based, Christ-centered, Bible-based re addiction recovery program. It's in over 2,000 churches in the United States. And, and I've been helping, just as an evangelist, train people to have RU chapters in their church because they're President Trump and the CDC said the number one problem in health threat in America is the addiction to opioids in our country. And you know who the pushers are? The doctors. Here's a prescription. Take this for, for pain. And some of it is four or five times stronger than the prescriptions for pain uh, that they used to give people after surgeries 20 years and back ago. Some of them are so strong you can get addicted in three days to them. And the doctor said, take as needed. Well, people are finding themselves addicted. And I won't go into all that, but there's a real problem. Um, well, in 1996, uh, an addict who got saved and got discipled and got victory came up with a program in a church in Illinois with his pastor. They started meeting with people on Friday night. This was greater than the AA program where uh, you have a higher power, the higher power could be the light in you, it could be that doorknob, it could be uh, God, the nameless God. This is a Christ-based program. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, not if he turns over a new leaf and goes through a 12-step program. 
and there's scripture, scripture, scripture that you work through. And the Bible says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, I can't read that, what's it say, okay? Five minutes. That ye may grow thereby. So you need to get new Christians, even if they're addicts, into the word of God so they can grow. Otherwise, they're gonna be helpless babies, spiritually, and the devil's gonna run over them all their lives. Well, uh, I was in speaking at an RU program in Martinsburg, West Virginia a couple weeks ago. The director of that program gave a testimony. Seven years ago, I was in prison on a drug-related charge, and I was addicted. Jesus Christ saved my soul. I got in the Word of God in the RU program, and folks, today, he's the director of their local church's RU program that meets every Friday night. The assistant director, Brother Tony, said, Brother Miller, four years ago I was in jail on a drug-related charge. I was addicted. He said, now I'm the assistant director of this program and I haven't touched anything for four years. And now he's ready to become a missionary. You see, folks, God doesn't save us and say, now get out of the way. I'm not trusting you with anything. He resets the bone. He restores us. And this fellow here was restored to his family position, to the family person, the father, to the family power. He got the family credit card, the ring, and to the family provision. You're going to, he said, put shoes on his feet. This dude's barefooted. My son needs good shoes. And he was restored to family fellowship. Verse 23, bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and he's found. And they began to be merry. Now let's go back to our command in Galatians chapter 6 verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken with a fault, Ye which are spiritual, reset the bone. Restore such a one to fellowship with God, to fellowship with others, to the privilege of being in the family, and to a position of authority and service, just like God restored you. That's what soul winning is all about. That's what Christians who backslide may get mean and may get evil, and may get stinky on the way out the back door. That's what reaching out to them over weeks and months and years to get them restored is all about. That's our ministry. Aren't you glad that was Christ's ministry for you?